on today's lecture is building on what we talked about last week when we looked at mark making storytelling and ideology today we want to look at some other ideas that are connected to that particularly semiotics semiotics uh, how that helps to create narrative and textual analysis, which is a way of going about trying to decode meaning. And then finally, we'll look at uh, certain examples of how identity works in that space. So semiotics, you would have already been familiar with this idea, is simply known as the study of signs. Signs, we'll talk about what is a sign. But largely, semiotics is really useful for us because it talks about understanding the world around us. Reality around us is a collection of signs. You each are a collection of signs. One of the interesting debates that you can have when we talk about meaning is to understand where meaning uh, lives and how it's created. Is meaning create constructed? Is our sense of the world constructed? Or is there an idea that there is a purely objective or more authentic, more true understanding of our lives? Those are in, you know, interesting positions to take, and both work in a different way. So is meaning created when you make a sign, or is meaning only contained within that sign? So the last few weeks we've been talking a lot about audience and authorship, where meaning resides, who makes the meaning, and so on and so forth. Now we're talking about the object that's made. Is that object just in itself meaning and that's it or does it then work to create new kinds of meaning so in order to start working within the world where you can start unpacking what something means you can talk about things like coding and literacy right a couple of lectures ago we talked about the idea of the languages that you speak in and the, the way you see the world are the coding and the literacies of the meaning explicit are they made obvious in the object or are they assumed? So one of the examples would be something like code switching, right? So you all behave in a particular way. If you move into a different culture, you might behave in a different way. So an example that was used, that's an interesting one, is to watch uh, Obama. Uh, in his first uh, election, one of the town halls that he did, he was asked a question about all the attacks on him. And he did the brushing the dirt off the soul, soul shoulder sign. Which, if you understand a particular literacy and a particular culture, you know what he's doing. But if you don't understand that, then he went on to explain what he meant. So he was very effectively talking to two different audiences. One that would understand the code, and another that he would then have to explore the code, uh, explore the code with. So it becomes really important. And last week, we already spoke a bit about production, contestations, and uh, the maintenance of ideology and the roles that science play in that. And we'll talk a bit more about that today as well. So let's talk about a sign. What is a sign? Sign can be a word, it can be image, sound, smell, taste, way something behaves, an artifact. Everything is a sign. Anything can be a sign as long as someone interprets it as meaning something, which is referring to or standing for something other than itself. We interpret signs as largely unconsciously by relating them to familiar systems of construction. What are we saying? There's two things that are happening there. Anything is a sign that can send meaning out. Right? It can send meaning out. But the way we understand that meaning is in context to the things that are happening around it. Which means what you've been doing with all your storytelling stuff whether it's too uh, static, too color, or you're looking at the, the, uh, the comic uh, five frame approach in each of those an object only makes sense in context to some of the other things that are happening within that object so those of you who did coffee for an example some of you really concentrated on just the cup so a lot of the meaning around that had to be un unpacked and understood some of you put quite the coffee quite explicitly in the context of someone going to work or uh, going to class and that was much more clear about what that coffee was doing then, right? So, semiotics work, signs work in and of themselves. They have meaning, but they also have meaning because of what is happening around them. Because a, a meaning of a sign is never fixed. 
It's fluid. What the objects around it do is help us clarify what that sign could mean. So what is a text? There's a certain hierarchy to how we think about these things. A text is a collection of signs. A text exists in relation to other texts. In of itself, a text, a collection of meanings, is meaningless. It only makes sense when there's intertextuality in the sense that you can compare the text to other things that are happening around it, which then give meaning to what that text is saying. All right? Even though sometimes we think there are global literacies on how uh, signs or text might work, that doesn't necessarily translate. So, if you're from Australia, you understand that when you're crossing the light, you have the red man, and he's telling you not to go, and there's a green man telling you to go, and there's a sign in between, which is a flashing red man, which is telling you to hurry up or finish crossing. But in other countries, it's a flashing green man. So the meaning of the text changes in the context you are, but eventually you figure it out because the relationship between those objects to most people is fairly clear. Eventually you will deduce the meaning. So a text only makes sense in relation to other text. A collection of text in a discipline or arena create a discourse. We'll talk more about what a discourse is. These are terms that are, are quite large and complex, but over the next few years, will help you get a better sense of the space you're working in. Because remember, you're not just going to talk to each other, you're going to be talking to people from outside of this space, right? So the second years at the moment are working on a project with photographers from VE. So they have to be able to have that conversation, even though people are coming from these different disciplines. So I've already talked about how text makes sense with other text. And is the relationship between the text intertextuality that creates its meaning. So you have signs at the bottom. Collection of signs make text. A collection of text talking about the same idea or the same field create a discourse, which is a formalized way of thinking that can be manifested by language, social boundary, defining what, what cannot be said about a certain topic. So as designers, you work within a discourse of communication design. If someone used communication design terms with you, so let's say take modernism. Modernism within, or modern design rather, within communication design has a very particular meaning which doesn't translate if you're talking about modernism within a social economic context or a political context. The meaning of the word actually changes. So you need to know which discipline you're coming from in order to be able to engage with the person. And in order to be able to engage the person, you look at your collection of texts, they create your practice. Foucault defines this course as a system of thoughts composed of ideas, attitudes, courses of action, beliefs, practices that systematically construct the subject and the worlds of which they speak. Now we spoke about this in week one, the visible and invisible. When you have enough of these together, they create a way of being, you understand how you're supposed to work and the worlds within which you can speak and engage in, right? So this sort of links back to that. Power knowledge is something we'll explore a bit more in, uh, in the subsequent, I think in semester two, where we'll talk about how that works. And we spoke briefly about it in lecture one with the power dynamics of a space such as this, but we're also looking at disciplinary power, whether it's visible or invisible, and how that works. But we'll explore more in semester two. So last week we did talk about ideology. Now we're going to try to give ideology a context within which it works. So just to remind you what uh, ideology is. So you have science at the bottom. You have text. A collection of text talking about the same thing. Create a discourse. And all the different discourses then try to fight for dominance within a system of ideological production. Such that system of values, beliefs that are shared by a bunch of people that are Product produced by that group, maintained by the group, but also then subsequently challenged. So that's what ideology was. We spent a lot of time last week talking about it, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, we also spoke about the idea of normative positions, right? Common sense. Everybody knows that and how that's come about. Uh, and the fact that the dominant ideology, the big ideas of our society, which is the stories that we're supposed to live and engage with, are constantly under pressure and being challenged by other ideas, right? 
So just, just to bring you back as to where we were last week. So where do these things sit together? This is my poor attempt to visualize. It is an oversimplification of how this thing works, but it's really just to give you a sense of how science texts work with each other to create ways of believing into things. So if you're an engineer, your discursive practice will channel your understanding of the world in a particular way. If you're a comm designer, you'll see the world in a different way. If you're a journalist, public relations person, your discourse, your discursive practices that you engage in will channel your view in a different way. All right? So it's really important to understand how these different practices work. And if you, as comm designers, are in a very uh, privileged place, have an opportunity in a lot of the things that you do to float over these discourses. So you don't have to be an expert engineer to work with engineers to help them tell their story better. But you need to understand that within those engineers, there is a discursive practice, languages, ways of thinking, that you need to be able to, first of all, know that exist, second, learn how to access, third, engage with to create the outcomes that you need. So it's actually a really important tool. You can use it in a way, almost as a diagnostic, to think about what are the discursive practices around this. What do I mean by discursive practices? All the words, language, books, knowledge that creates how we talk about something. Right? So if you're going to work with engineers, and that might happen quite often, to do infographics or to do a book or to do a series of drawings, how do you engage with engineers? And I say engineers because engineers work in a very different way. And designers are in a challenged position because you have to float over these spaces to work with different people. One of the things, if you listen to the By Design podcast, anybody listen to By Design? ABC? Now, if you listen to By Design podcast, there are some interesting conversations about how health communication works. And one of the most contentious, one of the most contentious issues in communicating about health is how do you do it to be accurate uh, and to be simple enough for someone to use. So as a communication designer, you are not going to be the health specialist. But you need to be able to access the language that they use, be able to talk to them in the language that they use, and then turn that information out into an outcome that's useful. All right? All of these things happen all the time. Okay? Uh, interesting one, another one, if you read Don Norman's book, The Design of Everyday Things, he talks about Chernobyl, and he brings his designer's eye to what went wrong in Chernobyl. Was it human error or was it poor design? Because of the poor design, things couldn't be communicated effectively and so on and so forth. So even though that space was designed by uh, engineers and nuclear physicists and so on, more and more designers are being brought into these spaces to help create user experience. Uh, you'll be hearing that word more as you go along. Uh, UX, right? Your inter or interaction design. You're coming into the space. So you actually have to be able to understand who you're working with and how to talk to them. So this can be a useful diagnostic tool. All right, so you have ideologies, and ideologies help create narratives, which are the big stories of our society. What are the kind of things we talk about that create these narratives? So the most com uh, recent one in Australia we've had would be the culture wars or the history wars, right? So this was sort of between the, the two schools of thought, one called the black armband view, uh, of history that was saying, you know, a white invasion, genocide, a destruction of culture, taking a very particular position. And on the other hand, you had the argument saying, well, Western culture doesn't, wasn't all bad. It brought enlightenment. It brought, so, uh, you know, different ways of thinking and so on and so forth. So you have back then, this is about what, maybe 10 years ago, uh, but an uh, a argument that was brewing for about 10, 15 years between different historians about what the right version of Australian history was. And that came into the political era and everybody gets involved. Right? So the culture wars were the big grand narrative because they were about national identity, what it means to be Australian, particularly of European descent. The more recent ideological narrative wars we are, we are engaging with is around climate change. Right? 
Is it man-made? Is it not man-made? Do we need to do something? Do we not need to do something? Even if we did something, China and India are not going to do something. So we shouldn't do something. So there's a lot of debates around that. And there's different ideological sort of positions being taken by people who are trying to fight for the normative position of how society would see itself moving forward. Right? So those are the kind of things that we are having to deal with and how ideology, uh, you know, creating dominant ways of thinking is linked to how we create stories. Where there are signs, there are ideologies. There is no ideologically neutral sign. Every sign in, inscribed into it is a politics, right? If you look around you, I can see some of you who have clothes on. The clothes are actually taking, and I, oh, I know all of you have clothes on, yes, my, my bad, sorry. But they're taking an ideological perspective. Some of you have plastic bottles. That's actually a sign that's extremely politically contentious. Some of you have reusable plastic bottles that's less uh, politically contentious. But all of these things can lead to greater unpacking. Signs that create texts, that create uh, discourses, that create ideologies, naturalize and reinforce the way things are. There are some things that we now take for granted, but we wouldn't have taken granted for 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and so on. Mm -hmm. Signs come out to create our way of being. So signs do not just reflect what the world is, but are actually actively involved in its creation. All right? And are intimately involved in history and how power is constituted. You can pick any historical event and start pulling a thread, and very quickly you realize that the narrative of that thread is extremely contentious. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes than we ever talk about. So one of the examples I like to use is uh, First World War, which allegedly started because someone, saw, uh, someone shot someone else, and then people were not happy about it. It wasn't as simple as that. There was a lot of things that were already brewing behind the scenes. They needed a catalyst, which happened to be the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand. Right? So it's all about trying to understand where these things come from, and the fact that all these ideas are highly contested. So within your discipline, the discourse of communication design, I have had debates with people like Bromwin and some other people. Where does communication design start? Some people say communication design starts when cavemen started making uh, markings on the door, on the, not door, on the stone, stone on the caves, right? So that's when meaning started. That's when communication design started. That's when graphic design started. And then in, in that sweeping sort of statement, claims the entire history of civilization as the history of communication design. Whereas some of us say, no, communication design started in world, after World War II, during sort of the, the now cons consumption age, with the rise of the commercial artists, artists that worked with advertising firms, very particularly to sell artifacts, sell objects, and comes from that lineage of the commercial artists. Why is that important? Because depending on where you sit on that debate, it changes the way you see your role as a designer. I think if you see yourself closer to the 1950s position, you see yourself as a more strategic, uh, audience-based, audience-focused producer of content. If you claim lineage of you know, all the other movements of more, more, uh, you know, art, art history, let's say, if you claim art history as part of the communication design history, you are then saying that communication designers are closer to artists than they are to strategic content producers. So it becomes actually part of how you see a profession. So understanding where history starts and where history stops for you is an important way of positioning yourself. Okay, so how do we then go about decoding meaning? One of the most common ways we do it is called textual analysis. When we, uh, this is Alan McKee's definition. It's, it's not the best definition, but it's a good starting definition. When we perform textual analysis on a text, we make an educated guess at some of the most likely interpretations that can be made of the text. So that's what we've done in class with a lot of your pair and shares of all the different things that you've made. You've sat there and you've tried to make an educated guess, given all the information that's available to you, and the context that's available to you. 
most of you have then subsequently gone on to present evidence as to why you think your position is a valid position. So the meaning making process and the part of the audience, but also the meanings that the uh, content producer is trying to convey, the inscription of meaning and decoding happens as you analyze text, the relationship between in that of that. So you are actually engaging in a very, very complex series of calculations in your head, in a snap, in trying to understand the meaning of uh, a picture. A lot of things happen very, very quickly in your head. And as we keep saying to you, as designers, you need to move from being unconscious or, 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 or sort of instinctive understanders of meaning to being strategic manipulators of meaning. You need to make that leap. So a lot of this is about training you to be able to learn how meaning is made so that you can then take it to the next step. And this is how you would go about roughly doing it. You begin at a level of the text, film, book. You can pick anything you want. Right? We're going to look at some uh, case studies later. Think about what the text means. And think about what it means in re 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 relation to other texts. Look at a text that it sits around. If you go home and you watch Oprah or Ellen or Dr. Phil, what's interesting is not Oprah, Ellen and Dr. Phil. What's interesting are the ads around it. What can the ads around it give you an insight to? It gives you an insight to who I, is the audience of that program. If you watch that program, you realize most of the ads are about making sure your toilet bowls are clean when your neighbors come to visit, make sure your kids have enough cordial and LCMs, and your clothes must be white, bright and white. Right? What are those things actually talking about? They're actually constituting the idea of what a woman should be doing at home and how she's judged on her ability to keep her home. So those ads are not just ads that just happen to be around the program. They are very strategic and they make sense to people watching it because they're linking into larger uh, narratives of what uh, a homemaker is supposed to be doing. All right. So textual analysis is about being able to look at those things, unpack them, see the different relationships they have with all the things that are happening around it. Think about, all right, what kind of member, you know, what kind of person is it talking to? What kind of person is it reflecting on? Who are the type of people it's trying to go out to? What kind of normative position is it trying to either uh, produce, maintain, or sometimes challenge? All right? So a lot of complex activities are going on at that time. So we do textual analysis to find out what we think are most likely uh, interpretations of the text. A lot of the stuff you guys have already done on authorship, you realize how complicated that is just within one classroom. So you haven't got, even gone out to the world at large. right? Just within a classroom, that's a highly complicated activity. McKee talks about tech context, context, context. What he's talking about here is the idea of what are the other texts that are floating around it? What is the discourse it's uh, working with it? So what are the other texts that it has a relationship with? And what is the grand narrative? What is the ideology it's working in? All right? You need to be able to do that with any object. Just some quick thoughts on pop culture, because I think pop culture is... I, I, I'm a big fan of pop culture, because I think pop culture is where um, you're really trying to connect with somewhere where people are investing their money. All right? Where people are saying, I have a relationship with these objects right now. It's not uh, based on a canon and so on. So pop culture is really powerful that way. Uh, we ascribe meaning to pop culture. We ascribe meaning to cultural products. So there was an article in The Guardian yesterday talking about peak beard. Did you read that? All right, the end of facial hair because we've reached peak facial hair because it's no longer trendy because everybody has it. So it's making a value judgment on what it sees as a cultural artifact. In this case, sort of a hipster, uh, Ned Kelly type beard. No two people read culture the same way, all right? So you might say, oh, I'm being really cool because I have a Ned Kelly beard. Someone else might go, oh, you're, two, you're 10 minutes ago because Ned Kelly beards are not cool. And as such, you then might change your perspective because culture completely is always uh, under changes and so on. So how you go about reading, those are the kind of things. We've talked about this before. 
you know, the frames that you think with, the language that you think with, the literacies that you have, race, age, gender, ideology, religion, all those things have an impact as how you see meaning. So, if we will try to bring everything together and say, all right, what, what am I trying to take away here? All right? We've spoken about notions of how semiotics works. Semiotics is really about almost a, a diagnostic, mechanical way of thinking about how meaning works. All right? Narrative is where we're pushing on from last week when we talked about ideology, mark making, storytelling. We're talking about narrative as bigger ideas that live within societies or cultures or, or groups of people. And now we want to sort of just bring that together, making meaning. One needs to understand how an artifact is coded. What is the narrative within which it lives? All right, so if you're given a series of ads to unpack or to understand, and this might be as part of your competitor analysis, all right? If you're asked to do a SWOT, do people still do SWOTs? You know, if you're asked to do a SWOT, strength, weakness, opportunity, threat analysis, how would you do go about doing that? Well, this is one way to do it. Understand the narrative in which the artifact is coded, in which discursive space it lives. Who is it talking to? What kind of knowledge do you need to have? Is it talking to engineers? Is it talking to scientists? Is it talking to health practitioners? Is it talking to skateboarders? All those kinds of things. How it relates to other texts. Not just the object you're looking at, but the things that live around it. right? Uh, and what it's not. It is learned, it is conditioned, and we are taught to associate meanings with a lot of things. So that's kind of some of the stuff that we keep talking to you back and back. Is when you're given an artifact to unpack, your brain goes at a split second and all kinds of meanings are created. You might not want to articulate the meanings, but the meanings are created. So what kind of case studies can we look at? So this was an article that appeared in the Age um, print and online a while ago, 2006. But it was about the heavy metal gangs in a rural community called uh, Wadea. Now the picture is at one level quite confronting, and especially with a headline like "Hate stalks a community where gangs rule roost." Uh, not the best headline, but you know. And it says that gang violence has turned the remote indigenous community of Wadea into a war zone. People are camping in tents like refugees in their own country, too afraid to roam. I uh, return to their homes as two rival gangs run riot to the community. And he talks about that. And there's the Iron Maiden gang and the Metallica gang and so on. Right? True story. But when you look at the picture, the picture is actually far more complicated than the hate. Because you realize very quickly, this picture is posed. It's not a picture that's reflective of reality, which we've spoken about photographs that have this sense of truth. Uh, but it's posed. So this, this guy in the middle looks extremely unhappy. The guy in the yellow shirt sort of is more bemused and wondering what's going on. But the guy behind him is directly smiling and doing the heavy metal uh, sign, I suppose. There's a guy on the left that looks like he's having a bit of fun. This is a posed picture. So it calls into question the ethics of putting that picture together with a story and perpetuating particular type of ideas we might have about certain communities and certain cultures. All right? The reason we understand what's happening, and if you didn't sit and analyze the picture, you would understand, sort of, you, you might process the image differently, possibly in a slightly racist way, is because of the discourse that exists around minority cultures. All right? We are told, we are trained to be afraid of things that we're not familiar with, not comfortable with, especially when they're aggressive. And there's a whole history of the aggressive black male that's tied up in, in sort of uh, Australian history and American history. So it plugs into a lot of those narratives very quickly. Then there's a photograph like this that we, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, where you have Kathy Freeman carrying the Australian flag and the indigenous flag, and the politics around that. For that couple of years, Kathy Freeman was the Australian person, right? Because she brought the idea that she embodied two cultures and so on and so forth. But when you compare this with the previous photograph, there's a tension there. They're both trying to tell us different stories and plug into different senses of how we see the world. So one of the things that, I know Bromin, oh, we didn't do flags this year, sorry. Uh, one of the things that I'm always fascinated by is flags. Now, where I come from, Singapore, there's very strict laws on how flags can be used, right? 
You can only display flags a certain period of the time of the year. All flags must be disposed in a particular way. You cannot have faded flags. You cannot have thongs with the flag. You cannot have underwear with the flag. All of that. Very strict rules. Right? There's a lot of reverence for the flag. And then you come to Australia and flags are on thongs. They are on underpants. They are on t-shirts. They are on stickers. It's suddenly an object that's regarded with great reverence in a lot of cultures. You can wear on your feet and step on. And there was a real disconnect there. And then something else happened a couple of years later. Uh, where the Australian flag really affected a lot of people because they didn't like the way it was being used. The Australian flag became co-opted uh, as part of the, whatever you want to call it, native rights, uh, white rights, I don't know, national rights, uh, with the Australian Defence League and things like that, getting involved in how they see the role of the flag and who's allowed and who's not allowed to use the flag. And that changed the discourse of the flag, from uh, the flag being an identity of the nation to now where you'll hear people saying, if I see a bunch of young boys with the Australian flag, I will cross the road, especially if you're not white. Right? There's a certain fear that now comes with a type of nationalism embodied by our young friends here, right? with uh, their, what do you call it? Southern, Southern, Cross. Southern Cross tattoos and Australian shirts and flags as capes and so on and so forth. So these images were actually really uh, disturbing. If you're a migrant into this country, or if you're a visitor, international student, or whatever, you associate the flag with its national values and national identity. And here you have the flag being used for very particular racist and violent reasons. So now, someone like me, if I see a bunch of young boys walking with Australian flag, in my mind, this image comes. And you're always worried, I don't know where this could go. This could just be a bunch of kids with a flag enjoying themselves off to the cricket. Or there could be a bunch of members of the ADL who's gonna, who are now going to bash me because I happen to be the wrong color. So it really does change the meaning of that object, depending on who uses it and the context in which it's used. So a simple object like the flag has a really complicated and, and, and difficult meanings to think about. So this is a simple example of one object. It's got a long story. Whenever we will talk about changing the flag, you know, you get people saying, oh no, my grandfather and my great-grandfather fought under the flag. We shouldn't change the flag. It's got a lot of meaning. We, it's our heritage, it's our history, and all those kinds of things. But to a different set of people, the flag has a different meaning, particularly more recent terms if it's been used, in some cases, quite literally as a weapon of uh, personal attack on people. Right? So again, it's just about trying to understand the complexity of the kind of things that are happening here that then uh, bubble up and come out. So another place that's interesting to look at is Melbourne. Melbourne is very cool. Right? I don't know if you guys get it when you live here, but in global terms, Melbourne is cool. You know, this, the best way I think I always think about Melbourne is Melbourne Olympics 1956. Black and white, very stylish, you know, very beautiful photographs. And then you have the sort of cheap Mardi Gras thing of the Sydney Olympics. Very colourful, lots of glitz, kind of ugly, if you ask me. Right? It was, there was a, the pageantry was overboard, whereas Melbourne was sort of sedated. So Melbourne has this sort of cool image. And how does Melbourne propagate its cool image? Through things like the tram, to things like Luna Park, St Kilda, to things like the beach in uh, summer in Federation Square. It's trying to tie up to all the different kind of things about what makes a city cool. It's not about the banks. It's not about the finance industry. It's not about manufacturing. It's all about a strange kooky thing. Melbourne's famous for its laneways and its street art, like historically famous for its street art and laneways. And it's something that Melbourne does leverage really well in selling its identity as a cool, happening, hip, uh, sort of city that's not Sydney or Gold Coast or Brisbane. Its way of positioning itself is very different. And if you want to try to understand how Melbourne is cool and gets away with this imaging, you have to understand the radical history of Melbourne. Melbourne, compared to how uh, Sydney was uh, developed and then subsequently uh, Tasmania, because Melbourne, remember, was a third city that was uh, put together in Australia. It's always had a very long history of People doing the wrong thing. 
for the launch of a freight. So when people left Tasmania and came to settle in Melbourne, they were not allowed to do so, they were not supposed to do so, they did it illegally and so on. If you look at the trade union movement and the triple eight movement, that's come from Melbourne, really been driven by Melbourne. So Melbourne's always had a bit of a, a naughty car, child, edgy kid, radical type history. So it does mean that you are allowed to be a bit more different, you're allowed to exist on the fringes a bit more. And this is coming from that kind of thing. So it's not suddenly people decided, oh, let's just paint the streets because we're cool. No. There would have been a certain set of things that would have happened, a certain atmosphere, a certain acceptability of types of practices that have now taken us to this kind of space. And so these are the kind of images you can see that I used to sell Melbourne. Or oh, Melbourne's very cool. It's very happening. I do think Melbourne's very cool. But anyway, so that's how it sells itself. How does Melbourne then sell itself to the rest of the world? If you're cool and you're happening, how do you communicate to the rest of the world uh, your kind of aesthetic, your kind of feeling. I slept all day. I woke with this haze. And I ran. So that's a very sexy ad trying to sell Melbourne. It's got the indie pop song, it's got trams, it's got street art, it's got bars hidden away. Melbourne positions itself very differently from the rest of Australia. And that's actually something interesting. So you can go and look online for ads that sell Sydney, uh, Gold Coast particularly. Gold Coast is very interesting. It's all loud colours and a lot of things moving on the screen. A lot of stuff happening. but. When you have established forms of meaning, that gives you another type of power. That gives you the power to subvert meaning. So we all know the absolute ads, and the absolute ads are really popular to the extent that you, all you have to do is put the relief, uh, the outline of the bottle, and we know what you're talking about. But that also means that you can subvert the meaning very simply. Because the meaning is fixed and so strong, not fixed, but it's fairly strong, you can actually take that and then change it around and play with it. Now, this one still has the bottle, but you can actually leave the bottle out completely. Even if you didn't have the tagline there, you would know what it's referring to. So, this allows you to jam the images that are there. And that's one of the things that I think uh, is very powerful that you can do to play with people's perception and their mind. So, if you look at these images, they all sort of fit a general uh, uh, idea that we have of what the Kelvin Klein aesthetic is. Some of you are laughing because you spotted the one picture that doesn't make sense, which is this one here that says reality for men. So this is another example of how you can culture jam images by doing certain things. So they've taken the, the general sort of uh, color sense, you know, the color palette, the layout, the way text is done, the, the way bodies are used, but they've changed one meaning to sort of go, that's actually another way to think about this. So you would also would have seen the iTunes one, where all of these people are chained up. So you can do a lot of interesting things with meaning once you understand what the dominant is. And the thing is, you cannot jam if you don't know what you're jamming against. And this is where stuff fails. We have seen student work that's almost there, but they haven't quite understood what about the jam 
they need, they've overdone or they haven't quite got. So if you understand dominant narratives, you can really mess with them. If you watch um, Natural Born Killers by Oliver Stone, there's a scene in there uh, called I Love Mallory, right? Who's the, the one of the female characters, I forgot who, who the actress is. Uh, and it's, it's a horrific scene of basically a father abusing his, his adult daughter sexually and so on and so forth. But it's done with the I Love Lucy soundtrack. And it's really disturbing because a part of your brain goes, I'm familiar with the setup. It's a sitcom setup. There's a father, there's a mother, there's a daughter, there's a laughter track. But what's going on visually in the screen doesn't fit the conventions of that format. And you can only make that kind of thing work if you actually understand the dominant uh, narratives that you are working with to subvert them. And that's why it's really important to understand. Now, uh, we've got about five odd minutes. I'm going to show you some ads. Now, we spoke about this ad in one of the classes. I want to just show you a series of no smoking ads. And I want to talk about how they fit in larger ways of thinking about ideology. This ad is a bit disturbing, so just keep that in mind. This is how your child feels after losing you for a minute. Just imagine if they lost you for life. So that ad works because it's, it's, it's got a quite a simple message. You're taking a child who's vulnerable, who's alone and needs, actual, needs to be protected. I mean, the homo sapiens as a species are quite pathetic in their sense. Our children are useless in terms of looking after themselves. So it, it's got all that described, and it does it very effectively. It just takes him to a crowded place where the mother is supposed to be the protector, and she walks away where he's left to fend for himself, and because he's very young and naive, he cannot actually comprehend what's happening. He breaks down. It's narratives that we are familiar with, you know, connected to notions of childhood, nurture, how we need to look after the most vulnerable of our society, so on and so forth. Now, you could take it to the next situation. Again, where you're using children to have that conversation with adults, but in this case, in a more explicit way. So again, we are using children here who have a particular position, right? In the previous one, it was the parents who were supposed to look after the child. Here now, the child is in the world and coming to you, and you are having to engage with the child in essentially uh, to be the absent, to be the parent in the absence of the parent and guide the child. So this ad again works because there are accepted conventions of how children are supposed to be 
and how we as adults are supposed to behave towards uh, the children and our power role and our relationship with them. So the ad, that ad again is very effective because it does a few things. One, it evokes our sense of our role as adults in dealing with a child, but also how we're supposed to guide them and look after them to give them the gu right guidance. And in this case, the, then children's, the children turn around and end up being reflections of the adult. So this ad again only can work because it's plugging into the larger debates around society, around smoking, but importantly understanding how we conceive ourselves within that space. Uh, I think we've got time for one more ad. Now this is again using children, but this time it's a bit more humorous, so that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> when this car's finished, me and my dad will just cruise around being all scucks and doing mean ass burnouts. Bro, my dad invented burnouts. He invented skiddies, more like it. Not. My dad's the best at us driver, even when he's been blazing. My dad invented blazing. My dad gets the blaze at us. When my dad's blazed, he drives smooth airs like this. Nah, move over, bro. My dad's been blazing, he drives like this. Nah, bro, like this. Nah, bro, like this. What street do I live on again? Hey, this ain't my car. Check out this cheeky fella. Looks just like me. I love this music. What music? I'm going for a piece of now. Again, that ad works because it does things that we're all familiar with. Children having a bit of a play, having a bit of fun. Well, why do we know it works? Because it's trying to tell you as adults, this is a relationship you have with children. So in order for those three ads to work, we actually need to understand what is the narrative of the relationship between children and adults. What is the role of a child? What is the role of adult? And how do those two then work with each other? It's only when you can understand those dynamics can you then start creating content that works within that space. Now these are fairly universalistic sort of situations. The other ads I have which, which break down this more particularly, uh, but that's the kind of thing that we want to get to. Alright? Let's just see how... Uh, should I show them a Paul Hogan ad? Should you see the Paul Hogan ad? America? Very quickly. You look like you need a holiday, a fair income holiday. In the land of wonder, the land down under. Now there's a few things I've got to warn you about. Firstly, you're going to get wet. Because the place is surrounded by water. Oh, and you're going to have to learn to say day. Because every day's a good day in Australia. G'day, Paul. G'day, love. Apart from that, no worries. You'll have the time of your life in Australia. Because we talk the same language. Although you lot do have a funny accent, come on, come and say good day. I'll slip an extra shrimp on the barbie for you. Come and say good day. Now these were ads from the 80s, and they were extremely successful. Now, the reason why I want to show you these ads, and I'll quickly put the next one while I talk. Um, good day. Travel is a wonderful Just thing. look at the images while I talk. Imagine the reason these ads are really successful is because France, they're working so on a projection of Australian no, identity that the rest of the world thinks is what well, you as Australians don't. Of so you Mr. might cringe at these ads and go, this is rubbish, this doesn't work. Oh, thanks, but to the world outside Australia, well, it's very the easy. It's the uh, red, the red center, it's koalas, it's kangaroos, and yep. it's Bushmen, if you want to see the it's world, those kinds of things. People don't come to Australia for culture, they come to Australia for the bush, at least the way the bush is sold. So these ads are not intended for the domestic well, market. So you might cringe at them and go, these are not ads, they don't work for me. But you are not the group that's actually targeted at. So to understand the group it's targeted at, you need to actually be able to do the things that we spoke about and unpack all those type of ideas. So you go, okay, that's the person who I'm talking to. All right? I think we'll leave it at that. So to summarize where we are, last week we talked about mark meaning, we talked about uh, how that creates forms of ideology and how storytelling works in that space. 
This week, we try to look at what builds up those elements where we can get to uh, creating ideology, where we can get to telling a story, we can talk about narrative, is to understand how you can use semiotics to understand meaning, as a, maybe as a diagnostic tool, so you can understand the, the systems in which people are making meaning, so you can pitch to them better. Remember, the key thing is we want you to move from being unconscious, instinctive meaning makers to strategic and tactical meaning makers. So you know exactly why you're doing what you do. And in order to do that, these are the kind of ideas that should start you on that road. Again, like I said last week, this isn't the end all and be all. This is just the start of getting you to think about these ideas. So over the next few weeks, when you come back from the Easter break, we'll continue looking at that. And in second semester, we'll do that a bit more explicitly. All right? Roman, do you understand me? All right, so we'll see you back in building nine for those of you that are coming for the feedback sessions. Thank you.